Okay, so in one of my previous videos, I mentioned that um, our friend Shannon Q is, a, is a, an example of someone who embodies emotional health as an adult. Now, I stand by that analysis. She does seem to be an emotional, healthy adult, but I misinterpreted the source of her emotional resilience. I said that perhaps I took a guess at why she was that way, and I said perhaps she was raised well because that's a really good guess, you know. Often, 99 times out of 100, someone who was raised well as a child did, you know, learns emotional resilience as an, as embodies emotional resilience as an adult. So what is the source of her emotional health? Um, I don't know. Maybe she's just cool like that. Maybe she just got it all together. She got it all together, that's for sure. So maybe she's just got it all together and you've fallen apart. <laughs> she's, she's got it on the ball and you, you know, you're falling apart at the seams. As the great social philosopher once said, Ice Cube once said, Ch chickity check yourself before you wreck yourself. Oh, you didn't know that Ice Cube was a great social philosopher? Well, now you know. He is. So, what's the source of her emotional resilience and her emotional strength? Who can say? Maybe next time I have her on my channel, we'll start trying to figure that one out. We'll start trying to piece it together. But in the meantime, I have often pointed to Shannon as a role model for the secular community as a role model and formerly she, prior to last Monday this past Monday she was the premier role model she was my go-to role model and I would say be like Shannon I stand by that you know be like Shannon she, we don't know why why she cool like that but uh, she's cooler than you I promise you that much. <laughs> yeah she's way cooler than you whoever you are she is I promise you that at least but you know be like Shannon means you, you ask yourself in a situation, what would Shannon do? You know, you're about to tweet out to somebody, religion is vile, superstitious nonsense. You ask yourself, what would Shannon do? do? Would Shannon really tweet this to somebody? Is this a productive tweet? Is this, is this going to really lead to a productive conversation between me and this religious person? Probably not. Would Shannon tweet that? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah, maybe she said something like that once or twice in anger. But, as I said, ch chickity check yourself. Have you tweeted something along those lines? Because a lot of you do. Have you tweeted something along those lines more than 10 times in the last two months? If you tweeted once or twice, fine, let it slide. Maybe you're in a, in a Twitter feud. Happens. But if you led with that, somebody said, a lot of people will say that in my comment section the first time I ever talked to them. If you lead with that, and you're tweeting that, or you're writing that in the comments, you got to ask yourself, is this, do I really think that this is going to lead to a productive conversation with the religious person? Do I honestly think that? Because let me just, you know, uh, reality check. It's not going to. <laughs> it's not going to. I'm probably the only one who will still deal with you after you tweet something like that. The rest of my co-religionists will write you off immediately, or should. That's not designed to lead to a pr productive conversation. So that is why I've said in the past, be like Shannon. Shannon doesn't do shit like that, or I wouldn't be calling her out as a role model for the secular community. Now, herein lies the rub, because originally Shannon was the premier role model for the secular community, and oh, how the mighty have fallen. Yeah, I'm sorry, Shannon, but now she is number two. Yeah, I'm sorry, Shannon, you know, sorry, sorry, girl, it was good while it lasted, sorry, but I gotta be honest, we have a new role model for the secular community, and that is Digital Hammurabi. Digital Hammurabi, they appeared on my show Monday, and they are, you know, they are going to be my go-to role models from here on forth. As a matter of fact, I'm not even sure if they consider themselves part of the secular community. He's kind of an agnostic, and she's sort of wondering. <laughs> wondering aloud, is there a God? Wonder, I wonder. She's, she's, she's wondering. She's not sure, one way or the other. And I find that a reasonable position, honestly. But they are, you know... Shannon, number two is fine. Shannon, you know, you st everyone gets a prize, Shannon. You still get a prize. Number two is really good, Shannon. It's really good. Keep crying. Keep climbing the mountain. Keep trying. Keep trying. So you're trying to be encouraging to Shannon. Why? Because Shannon's really cool. You know, she, like I said, she's cooler than you, whoever you are. But they're a little bit higher up the mountain. And there are better role models for the secular community. And let me explain why. Now, given their occupation, okay, I was expecting them to be and which they both do by training, they have a, a mode of, of 
operandus, a modus operandi that by training has been probably drilled into them. Um, whenever they are presented with something, when they, when they are about to make an assertion, they, const they do a constant process of rigorous self-examination, wherein they try to process out, you know, confirmation biases. There are confirmation biases on the atheist secular side of the equation, just as there are on the religious side. There really are. And as far as I can tell with them, they do a rigorous process of self-examination anytime they're about to make an assertion, you know, is this true or is this something I want to be true? And they try to parse the difference between those two. Now that's by training in their field. They're academics by training. So you would expect that type of rigorous self-examination in the field, in, the, in their scholarly endeavors. What I did not expect to find, and I'm relatively certain I'm reading this correctly, is they both do it in their own person. That's what I wasn't expecting to find. He described himself as introverted. I got that immediately. I would describe, or not introverted, um, introspective. Introspective, I got that immediately. Her too. I got that they are a lot more introspective than most people. And that's why they are a lot more reasonable, ultimately, when it comes to these questions and the, and the, you know, God, no God, these questions, secular religious. I found them eminently reasonable. And I found them eminently reasonable because I got that both of them have done a process in their own life that is relatively similar to their academic process, which is rigorous self-introspection, self-examination. And one of the reasons why I like having people on my show, why I, why I have atheists on my show, is because I don't really feel like I can read somebody until I've interacted with them. Now, that is not something I necessarily could have picked up by watching them on a video. But I'm almost 100% certain that is correct. Why? Because you cannot fake that. You cannot fake that. I would pick that up immediately. You can't fake that. It's something I just got from them. They're both extraordinarily introspective. They would describe it to a fault. This is a guess on my, bat, on my part, but I'm guessing both of them would say they're introspective to a fault. I don't agree. I think they are, they are role models for the secular community. They are exactly as introspective as people should be. Now, why would they describe it to a fault? See, there was only one false note in the whole conversation. It was an excellent conversation as far as I was concerned. There was one false note, and that was struck by me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was. Really, honestly, it was. Other than that, it was flawless. A flawless conversation. Very, very interesting and very, very deep and substantive. The false note was struck by me. I said to him something along the lines of, I, I think you have resentment or towards your past or something like that. And I don't really know what I was getting at. And I'm not really sure why I said that or what, what I was reaching for. Um, he is a little bit more in the public arena. Now, here's the interesting thing, because I sensed from both of them, I sensed very strongly reticence, intense reticence to they are, they are doing something that as far as they're concerned in their, in their professional lives, they are examining the truth. So they are developing expertise in the field that we are talking about. So if you are going for authority on the subject that we are talking about, say Sumerian, take it out of the controversial and say ancient Sumerian grammar, you'd go to them and they would be a, an authority on the subject. Okay, And as such, I find them very, very reticent um, to call balls and strikes. They might know things. And they see these public debates, and I find them both reticent to say, you know, that's just not true or that's not so. And they probably think that's a fault. And probably other atheists tell them that's a fault. And I'm telling them that that's the right way to be, and that's wise. That's the right thing to do, and that's wise. Why? Because ultimately it is not, it is more important. It's not just about what you know. Honestly, it's not just about what you know. You know the truth in a situation, or you know something that's, that's accurate information, good for you. It's about what the other person can process. It's about what the other person can hear, quite frankly. And if someone isn't ready to hear what you have to say and present as truth, you are counterproductive to the conversation as a whole. You're introducing something that isn't going to help. And I'm, 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 I'm certain that they are reticent. And I'm relatively certain that they think that's a failing on their, on their part. And I'm telling them it's not. It's actually correct and it's wise and it's the right way to be. Because it's not just about what you know, it's about what somebody else can hear and process. Otherwise, the information is counterproductive. Now, one last side note. Uh, excellent conversation overall. Actually, one of my favorite. Probably my favorite one so far. 
And yeah, they're, they're, they're the new role models in town, you know? So instead of being like Shannon, try to be more like them. <laughs> sorry, Shannon. <laughs> I gotta tell the truth, Shannon. Sorry. You're still cool, but you know, they're better. Sorry. Um, one last note we were talking about, I asked them their favorite books on the Bible, and they said one of which was Ezekiel. And just an interesting side note, I mentioned in passing that, you know, Ezekiel is written as a prophetic book, and the poem The Wasteland adopts the voice that the author of Ezekiel uses. Uh, for example, in Ezekiel chapter 38, um, goes, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog and the land of Magog, the chief priest, and prophesy against him. That voice is used in the wasteland. Say, what are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this sto stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say, for you know only the... Um, uh, I forget the rest of the passage, but it's adopting the same voice. And a common analysis is that that's a literary device where he's kind of alluding to the wasteland as a prophetic poem because Ezekiel is a prophetic book. Just food for thought, just something to think about. One of the great masterpieces of 20th century, 20th century literature. That's, that's all for now. That's all I got to say. Amen. Great conversation.